slideshow going. Awesome. We see you. Uh, so this is the the last group of talks for today's section of uh, LCC 10. Hope everyone's loving the content so far. I know most of us have been watching uh, for the entire day and learning and enjoying. Uh, so to kick off the uh, last section for today of three talks, uh, Logan is going to be talking about conlanging beyond the IPA. So I'm quite interested to hear what you say, Logan, please take it away. All right. Hi. So, uh, yeah, I'm Logan. Um, I am also one third of the Theory Neutral podcast, and I irregularly blog about language and linguistics representation in media. And one thing that is horrendously underrepresented in modern media, despite the proliferation of conlangs in popular culture, is stuff that human actors can't pronounce. Um, however, I'm not going to be talking exclusively about that because there are multiple ways to create naturalistic human languages also that cannot be represented in the IPA. Um, but before we get to that, <clears throat> I wanna talk a little bit about the blank page effect. Um, so there, there's these two kind of interacting ideas, the blank page effect, the paradox of choice. If you have too many choices in front of you, like that sounds like a good thing. It's great to be able to make choices, uh, except it turns out to be really hard. Um, if you have too many choices, then most people end up just shutting down and saying, I don't know what to do. Um, and it's a lot easier to work with something that's already quote unquote on the page than to just spew out artistic greatness from nothing. Um, so even though unlimited choice sounds great, actually having constraints allows us to make better art by engaging the parts of our brain that solve problems instead of having to just generate stuff from nothing. Um, so when you're doing a quote unquote, normal conlang, there's a lot of constraints that come just from, you know, working within the idea of making a new human language. You've got a large but still finite set of phonemes that humans can make. They're encoded in the IPA. You have a ready way, a ready-made way of writing them down. Um, there's all kinds of research on typology and how languages work and, and stuff that you can draw from. And if you want to step outside of that box, then, well, what do you even do? How do you even start? Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that non-human languages can vary. Um, and I will talk about those in other forums, but because I have a limited amount of time now, we're only going to look at phonology. Um, one constraint that I have is I have to work with a romanization. If I cannot figure out a way to conveniently transcribe whatever language I am working on um, in a way that I can type on a standard American keyboard, then like I just hit a brick wall and I can't do anything with it. So that may or may not apply to any of you, but that's a huge constraint that I already start with that helps cut down my choice of spaces. Um, However, note, phonology as a general term includes non-audio modalities. So let's look at some of those alternate possible modalities. We've got oral aural language, which is what I am using right now. There's visual sign languages. There's tactile sign languages. Um, and sign languages are like a whole thing. Again, I have limited time here, so I'm not gonna tell you about sign languages. I'm not an expert in sign languages. Uh, you can go study sign languages. Um, writing is another modality that language occurs in, um, and uh, there are some conlangs that are purely written and cannot be spoken. Uh, whistling is another human modality. Uh, whistling is kind of like writing, in fact, in that it is not something that anybody acquires uh, as the primary modality for their first language uh, during natural language acquisition. It's more of a language technology similar to writing, except it turns out to be way more common and way easier to invent. Uh, writing has been invented independently a handful of times throughout history, but whistling has been invented all over the place. 
um, even though you don't hear about it so much uh, in the modern day, uh, because the uses of whistling have largely been supplanted by modern telecommunication technology. Um, so there's a whole typology of how whistling registers interact with the normal mode languages that they are associated with. Um, but what if we just ignore all of that and think about a whistling language that existed independently? Um, say there were some aliens that had a different vocal tract than humans, or maybe birds uh, that can't pronounce regular human uh, phonemes. And so whistling is the only thing they have, and they do acquire it as uh, their primary modality. Uh, what could we do with that? Uh, well, we can still go and look at all of the wealth of research that's been done on existing whistling languages and see how do they make distinctions between phonemes with such a limited uh, phonetic repertoire. Um, it turns out you might think, well, I can whistle in a bunch of different ways, uh, but that doesn't matter. Uh, natural whistling languages totally throw out all the different mechanisms that you can use to produce whistles as sources of distinction. Um, so that cuts down our, our decision space a ton already. Um, and we basically have two dimensions to work with. You can alter the amplitude and you can alter the pitch. So let's go ahead and select a maximally distinctive subset of amplitude and pitch patterns from the things that are attested in natural whistle languages. Um, there are natural correspondences to vowels and consonants. Uh, because again, like in the real world, whistle languages correspond to regular oral aural languages, um, and they transpose the uh, categories that uh, that come from the oral languages. You don't necessarily have to do that, but it's really convenient to. <clears throat> so we can think of vowels uh, and equivalent to vowels in our whistled language as steady, smooth tones with peaks in amplitude. Um, and I'll just quickly note here that uh, that kind of thing does not actually always correspond to a vowel in a uh, natural whistle language, but it's a convenient thing to, to slot into the vowel category for our purposes. Uh, and then consonants uh, are things that are patterns of alterations to vowels and represent troughs in amplitude. Uh, so less loud bits of the speech signal. Um, Note here that uh, consonants under this definition uh, don't have a single identifiable pattern. Uh, they are defined by the rules that you use to alter the vowels that come next to them. <clears throat> and there's a few ways you can do that. Uh, you can say that, oh, I'm going to warp the vowel so that it gets a little louder or it gets a little quieter or the amplitude changes you know quickly or slowly or the frequency goes up or goes down or stays the same. Um, so uh, given this uh, grid of different ways that you can fiddle around with the vowel signal to indicate a particular consonant, um, I came up with this three by three grid of nine consonants, uh, which represent basically instructions for if I start with a particular vowel tone, what do I do with it in order to warp it at the beginning or at the end? Um, and then the vowels uh, are defined by a frequency peak that takes a certain amount of time. Uh, and we get some diphthongs from doing smooth transitions in the frequency space while in that amplitude peak. Um, additionally, we have a schwa vowel, uh, which uh, is actually a feature I stole from Turkish uh, whistling registers, uh, where the schwa vowel doesn't have a specific frequency associated with it. And you might think, oh, well, how are you going to tell it apart from the other vowels if you know there's only a single frequency band, there's not multiple formants, um, you know, it, it will necessarily overlap with the other vowels. Well, the answer is uh, it just doesn't take as much time. So all the other vowels are at least two time units. The schwa is just really short. And that's how you tell, oh, the, the specific frequency here doesn't matter. Um, so <clears throat> that's option number one, all sorts of different ways to play with whistles. <clears throat> option number two, 
Uh, I came across a couple of very interesting uh, bits of research into canine phonology and canine understanding of human speech a while ago, um, which, uh, which provided some very interesting restrictions to work within. Um, so dogs obviously cannot produce the same sounds as humans can, but they can produce some sounds. Um, they have a lot of shared mammalian vocal physiology. Uh, so you can kind of adapt uh, IPA symbols or Roman alphabet symbols uh, to, to represent similar kinds of articulations in a canine mouth if you want, uh, but it's not actually going to be uh, the canonical IPA sounds if you actually had a dog do that articulation somehow. Um, notably, it turns out that dogs have a very small horizontally arranged vowel space uh, you might think, well, the canine vowel space should be huge because like their snouts are longer than human mouths, but experimentally that turns out not to be the case. Uh, additionally, their formant range is completely outside of the human vowel trapezoid. Uh, so yeah, literally cannot be represented by IPA. Um, additionally, the so this is the second interesting bit of research. Uh, it turns out that uh, based on neurological studies, dogs may not be able to distinguish minimal pairs. So that, that's like a psychological neurological change in another species that has a direct impact on the phonological structure of a possible language. So how in the world do you design a language that doesn't have any minimal pairs? Well, it turns out there's an easy way to do that if you design a phonology based on syllable level features rather than segmental level features. So let's say our proposed canine language uh, has C, D, optional, coda, C, syllables. So every syllable must have at least two segments, no just plain ah. Um, then every feature that we use to define a syllable must control at least two segments. And if that is true, then by construction, there can be no minimal pairs among syllables and thus no minimal pairs among words that you build out of those syllables. <clears throat> um, so just for purposes of this talk, uh, I'm gonna give an example with features of backness, roundness, openness, stoppage, and nasality. <clears throat> um, oh, there should have been a, a minus there, plus slash minus, but well, whatever. Um, so if we combine all of those, that, whoa, I'm scrolling on accident, didn't mean to do that. Here we go. If we combine all of those, then we get about 24 possible distinctive syllables where every one of these features alters what consonants are allowed to occur in the onset, what consonants are allowed to occur in the coda, and what vowels are allowed to occur along with those. And every alteration in a syllable level setting changes at least two of those segments. Um, now, 24 total syllables to work with doesn't sound like a lot, but it is larger than the segmental inventory of a lot of human languages. So if you just treat those as segments for building the rest of your language, you're good. Um, additionally, you don't have to stick with just these features. Um, I actually proposed a more elaborated version of this kind of system uh, to David and Jesse for the latest season of Lang Time Studio, uh, and Jesse didn't like it, so they're not using it. But uh, you can like make this bigger and, and get a larger set of uh, syllables with this kind of approach if you wanted to. <clears throat> uh, now, let's go way out in left field, uh, languages that cannot be articulated by humans or even mammals. Uh, Fish A is a language that I came up with when I was suddenly inspired after going to the local aquarium and watching an electric eel swim around for a while. Uh, so Fish A is imagined to be spoken by alien electric quote unquote fish, because they're not actually fish because they're not from Earth, uh, using electrocyte organs. And uh, the restrictions here came from looking up the signaling abilities that exist in real world electric fish. Uh, in particular, there are some pretty stark differences between how saltwater fish, uh, saltwater electric fish and freshwater electric fish work uh, because saltwater and freshwater 
uh, conduct electricity differently. Um, so these alien fish specifically live in fresh water uh, and that changed the types of electrocytes that they might be able to evolve in that environment. Um, so I ended up settling on having three, uh, three signal channels, uh, two of which are indistinguishable from each other because they've got two sets of electrocyte organs that produce the same kinds of waveforms and a third one that produces a different waveform shape. Um, so when you overlay them all, uh, there's a two-part chord that sounds like it's played on a single instrument, basically, and a third, uh, a third drone frequency, uh, if we try to analogize this to sound. Uh, also, it turns out that amplitude and signal frequency are related uh, for electrocyte signals because it takes time to build up larger peak charges. So when your amplitude goes up, your frequency goes down. Uh, so unlike whistling, because the amplitude and the signal frequency or the signal um, components are connected to each other, you only have one dimension to work with, uh, which is why I ended up going with a total of uh, deciding that these fish would have three ultracyte organs so we could get more, uh, more of that signaling capacity back, uh, bandwidth. That's the word I was looking for, more of the bandwidth back. Um, additionally, electrocytes can't instantaneously transition between discrete frequencies, and controlling the start time of a wave train is easier than precisely controlling the stop time, so that gives us something to work with in defining phonotactic constraints for this particular alien species. Um, and as a result of those constraints, I came up with a phonology where we have independent phones, which are things that can occur syllable initially, and you have a whole uh, a whole bunch of channels that start uh, sending out wave trains all at once, uh, and then dependent phones, which uh, involve either one or two formants and allow the wave trains to trail off, not necessarily in synchrony. Uh, and then, similar to the canine language, uh, we organized the phonology in terms of syllables so that it was easier for me to transcribe uh, because all the different ways that you can combine different uh, formant frequencies from this particular biological system uh, turns out to be super complex, but when you squish them together into syllables, uh, there's basically harmonies that show up which reduce the uh, number of contrasts you need to specify. Um, so I could work out a romanization that didn't use too many letters uh, based on this classification of the different types of syllables that exist. <clears throat> uh, finally, we're going to look at a possible cephalopod phonology. Um, so no specific cephalopod is mined here. Uh, I just wanted to use general features of cephalopod physiology that exist in cuttlefish and squid and octopuses uh, to figure out an interesting system that maybe could be used by aliens. Um, However, there's one constraint that I did not like from nature. Uh, it turns out actual cephalopods are almost certainly colorblind. Um, so if you look up how cephalopods uh, do intraspecific signaling uh, rather than extra specific signaling, so how they communicate with other members of their own species, as opposed to like patterns that they use to hide uh, or to intimidate predators or prey or whatever, um, intraspecific signals are all monochrome. Uh, and that's super boring. So whatever, we're designing aliens. Uh, our aliens can have all of the motor capabilities of cephalopods, but they're gonna be able to see colors because that's cooler. <clears throat> so uh, cephalopod color changing uh, depends on three layers of cells. Uh, at the bottom, you've got iridophores, which produce blues and greens, leucophores, which uh, produce white and they can mask the iridophores and provide a background for the top layer. And then the top layer are chromatophores, which produce all of the other colors that octopuses and squids can show off. So black and red and orange and yellow. Um, and they can vary the saturation by changing how they activate the leucophore background. So you can do uh, super saturated colors or pastel colors. Um, and it turns out, um, Cephalopods don't like employ their massive brain power to individually control every single uh, chromatophore in their skin. Uh, there are neurological subsystems that produce specific combinations of patterns. Um, so even though 
there aren't constraints, like, there aren't uh, mechanical constraints like you get with the human vocal tract where like it is a particular shape. We can only make particular sounds with that shape. Um, mechanically, they could produce any kind of image, but neurologically, we've got some more constraints on what the phonotactics and the phonology can look like. So for example, all segments come with a foreground and a background color. Um, and you can manipulate the foreground and the background independently, but you can't just like blend them into a single layer. <clears throat> Additionally, there are constraints on uh, actual mechanical constraints on which colors can be background and which colors can be foreground uh, because like they actually are physically layered on top of each other. <clears throat> Um, so if we look at solid patterns, uh, as being somewhat equivalent to vowels, kind of like, uh, in the whistling phonology, I had, uh, continuous tones being equivalent to vowels, uh, then we can, again, look at ways of messing with those static patterns, um, and introducing either spatial or temporal variation in them as ways of acquiring consonants. Um, so then I just looked up like what in the uh, oceanographic marine biology literature uh, do we have in terms of actual you know, patterns that show up on cephalopods. Um, and again, we can split these into static patterns and dynamic patterns. So we've got alterations over space and alterations over time, uh, which means this doesn't actually map really cleanly onto like the human language idea of consonants. There's two totally different categories of like temporal consonants and spatial consonants. Um, and for romanization purposes, like maybe we could do onset versus coda. Uh, the actual romanization I came up with this is uh, super complicated, so I'm not going to show it to you because that doesn't matter. Um, but the key idea is there are neurologically derived constraints um, on which static patterns can pair with which dynamic patterns, on which combinations of patterns can actually form phones, as I talked about on the last slide. Um, and it might actually be more sensible to make analogies with sign language phonology, because as I said earlier, uh, sign languages are like a whole thing that also cannot be written in IPA. <clears throat> um, I probably just talked way too fast, so I sincerely apologize <laughs> to the captioner, um, but uh, that's what happens when I am working with constrained time. And uh, yeah, now we have some time for Q and A. Thank you so much, Logan. Um, the YouTube chat is blowing up with the most puns I have ever seen. Um, <laughs> although I did particularly like William Annis's uh, note that <clears throat> uh, syllable length are measured in more. But I'm done. Yeah, I, I have long wanted to make an ant language, the little tiny insectoid um, using chemical trails. And I have not thought of, of how I could possibly represent that yet, because like you, if I can't just type it, maybe that's outside of my, my interest. Um, I'm not seeing any particular questions come up, although there are a lot of comments about uh, what echidnas can and can't do and things like that. Um, <laughs> I I don't know if if you remember, if anyone remembers at the last language creation conference, um, I did challenge people to come up with a language that didn't use contrastive features. And so I was like, oh, are we onto something moving away from, from minimal pairs? But I, I think that syllable level contrast is, is still contrastive. So I, I don't think yep. we've done it yet. Um, well, if there, if there aren't any uh, explicit questions yet, I'll, I'll see if I can uh, hop back on YouTube and, and scroll through the chat in case anything comes up. But uh, I did make a few notes this morning on extra things that were not in my slides uh, that I can well, tap nice. on to the end. Um, so in addition to working with the syllable level uh, featural phonology, um, this also affects diachronics. I don't usually care about diachronics too much. Um, I don't like do the historical method, so I didn't think of it when I was making the slides. Uh, but if you wanted to like think about how to evolve a canine language through time, because you're into diachronics like that, um, that like that uh, psychological limitation, 
uh, has direct implications for how sound change can work over time. Uh, because if you change only one segment at a time, uh, it's going to cause a lot more mergers than you would think if you were you know, working from a human point of view. Um, so all of your sound changes either have to alter two segments at a time, they have to change a syllable level feature, not a segment, um, or you just have to recognize that if you start changing individual segments, then you're gonna have to do another pass of figuring out where all of the mergers are because you introduce minimal pairs which aren't audible to your target audience. Um, and then uh, another thing, actually this is, uh, kind of connected with uh, my media review work, which otherwise was not going to be part of this talk at all. Uh, I recently read Project Hail Mary, which is the latest novel by Andy Weir of the Martian fame. Um, and not to give too much of a spoiler, uh, but there is a suggestion in that book of a conlang which for which we should look to whale anatomy and song structure uh, for relevant design constraints. So that's something I might be looking at in the future. Uh, there has been a lot of talk about, so quite frankly, you're inspiring a lot of people in the YouTube chat. Uh, any <laughs> thoughts on right. a psionic sonar language? I don't know what psionics would do to that, but a sonar language. Uh, yeah, so that's the, there's a couple of different ways that I would approach that. So one of them obviously is taking the, uh, the, the cetacean route. Um, look at how whales and dolphins uh, communicate. Um, and that would be largely constrained by the, the anatomy that they use to produce sounds, uh, much like humans are. Um, making it, uh, I, I'm going to guess that by psionic sonar, the idea is that like you can project images, like sonar images directly to another person. Um, if that were possible, I don't really feel like that would be an interesting conlanging experiment because it kind of just bypasses language entirely. Um, and additionally, I, based on what I do know about cetacean biology, uh, I don't think it's actually possible to do that. They, they just don't have enough uh, fine control over the types of pulse trains that they can emit. Um, what, the, what they can emit to then interact with the environment is much less complex than what comes back after it has interacted with the environment. Um, but the other thing to look at uh, would be bats because you know bats also use sonar. Um, so you've got two completely different evolutionary lineages, uh, which uh, if you you know dig into the biological literature on, uh, would give you potentially completely different sets of constraints for how to uh, build a language that is built up around the idea of like this creature had a pre-existing sonar system now it wants to use it to encode language too <clears throat> but like you said earlier you know if something's boring on earth that's okay we're making aliens yeah exactly you know if, if you're if if cephalo ah, if cephalopods turn out to be colorblind then screw it my alien cephalopods aren't colorblind because that was a boring constraint i didn't like that one <laughs> the power we wield as conlangers indeed just don't throw out all of your constraints because then you've got a blank page and now you have to go find new ones. Yeah, and that was that was a very good point too. The the blank page effect where we've probably all made that kitchen sink language at least once. Yep. Um, although I will say people are saying for your facts here, uh, citation needed. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Well, I have plenty of citations that are provided uh, along with my abstract on the web page. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, please hop over to the YouTube chat and wrangle these punny, punny people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, they, they are actually talking and like, hey, this is a really cool idea for, for something I want to try and I want to look at. But um, I'm not seeing any actual questions come out of it at the moment. All right, well, feel free to ask me questions later if you have a, a fridge moment. <laughs> Thank you so much, Logan. Thank you. Yep.
and to size comment in the chat citation needed that was painful that wasn't me that's just me reading the youtube chat um next up uh we're gonna have benjamin fox ben